Come to thee this evening, seeking a word from thee. Do thou speak to our hearts, open our minds. Thou hast given to us the infallible, inspired, inerrant word of God. We pray that as we read it together, as we meditate upon it, that the Holy Spirit would take of the things of Christ and reveal them unto us. Take, Lord, the scales from off our eyes. Grant us clarity of understanding. Help us to hear what God has to say to us. Lord, we wait upon thee. We look to thee. Do thou bless us this night and help us each one to find a relevant message from thee for our souls. For Jesus' sake, amen. We shall now read in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul's first epistle to the Corinthians, we'll read chapter 10. Moreover, brethren, I would not ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud, and all passed through the sea, and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and did all eat the same spiritual meat, and did all drink the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But with many of them, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Neither be ye idolaters as were some of them, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed, and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted, and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured, and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things happened unto them for in samples, and they are written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. There is no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. Wherefore, my dearly beloved, Flee from idolatry. I speak as to wise men. Judge ye what I say. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? If we be many are one bread and one body, for we are all partakers of that one bread. Behold Israel after the flesh, are not they which eat of the sacrifices partakers of the altar? What say I then, that the idol is anything, or that which is, sac that which is offered and sacrificed to idols is anything? But I say that the things which, God, which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And I would not that ye should have fellowship with devils. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. You cannot be the partaker of the Lord's table 
on the table of devils? Do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? All things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. Let no man seek his own, but every man another's wealth. Whatsoever is sold in the shambles, that eat, asking no question for conscience sake, for the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. If any of them that believe not bid you to a feast, and ye be disposed to go, whatsoever is set before you, eat, asking no question for conscience sake. But if any man say unto you, This is offered in sacrifice unto idols. Eat not for his sake that showed it, and for conscience sake. For the earth is the Lord's, and the fullness thereof. Conscience, I say, not thine own, but of the other. For why is my liberty judged of another man's conscience? For if I by grace be a partaker... Why am I evil spoken of for that for which I give thanks? Whether therefore ye eat or drink, or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. Give none offence neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God. Even as I please all men in all things, not seeking mine own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. Amen. May God bless to us the reading of his word. Now tonight I'd like to particularly direct your attention to verses 12 and 13. 1 Corinthians 10, verses 12 and 13. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. There is no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. Here tonight we have two verses, two verses that are very encouraging and at the same time, very challenging. The chapter begins by telling us about Israel. Tells us how they started off well from the land of Egypt, on their way to the promised land. But it's not enough to start off well. Of the two million or more that left Egypt, only two entered the promised land. Then the second half of the chapter deals with the danger of idolatry. Eating things offered to idols. Now there's not much danger, I suppose, of you and I worshipping Greek idols or eating things offered to Greek idols. But that doesn't mean to say that We do not have a problem today with idolatry. An idol is anything that comes between us and God. An idol is anything that would distract us from worshipping God. Anything that takes command of our hearts, controls our thoughts, becomes central to our existence. And sadly, we're easily tempted by the world and carried away by worldly thoughts and pleasures, these modern idols. So first today, in looking at this passage, I want you to notice the danger of self-deception. Let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Now there's an enormous difference between thinking you stand and actually standing. There are many who think they stand, but they don't stand. 
And sadly, in today's churches, there's very little self-examination. That's something important, something that's greatly stressed in the New Testament, to examine yourselves. Lots of people think, well, I'm a Christian. I go to church. I've been baptized. I take communion. I've got faith. I'm okay. But are they? Jesus said something very, very challenging at the end of that great sermon, the Sermon on the Mount. He said, not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many shall say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done many Wonderful works. And I shall say to them, Depart from me. I never knew you. Quite a thought, isn't it? People who prophesy. People who cast out devils. People who heal the sick in the name of Christ. And Christ will say to them, Depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. It's easy to say we have faith. Many shall say, Lord, Lord. But that's not good enough. Do we have saving faith? There's all kinds of faith. So many people say, I believe in God. I believe in Jesus. I've got my faith. And then their life is quite different. Different from the life of the Christian as described in the scriptures. James said, The devils have faith. The devils believe and tremble. Faith without works is dead. A faith that doesn't express itself in love, in love to God and love to one another, it's dead. So, yes, we must have faith, but it must be saving faith. It must be a faith that shows itself in our lives. And shows us itself in our lives, distinguishing us from those who are dead in trespasses and sins. Although they say they've got faith too. Faith which works by love. Faith that expresses itself in works and in life. Think of Israel here. We're told about them. That uh, they were all under the cloud and passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Did all eat the same spiritual meat? Did all drink the same spiritual drink? For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. But with many of them God was not well pleased and they died in the wilderness. They'd been baptized unto Moses. It's interesting that, just as a side thought here, that here's baptism that's not immersion. It was the Egyptians who were immersed, and they drowned and perished. The Israelites passed through the sea. Immersion is not essential to baptism. They were circumcised. They took the Passover. They all set out on the pilgrimage journey, as it were. They passed through the Red Sea, baptized unto Moses. They ate of the spiritual meat, the manna that God sent down from heaven. They drank of the rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Symbolizes Christ, the water from the rock. But they perished. What a warning to us then, and what a challenge. Jesus said, there's a broad gate and a broad road that leads to destruction, and many are on that road. And then there's a narrow gate and a narrow way that leads to life, and few there be that find it. Are you one of the few who has found the narrow gate and is carefully walking along that narrow road 
that leads to heaven. <coughs> There's a need then for self-examination. Think of 2 Peter chapter 1. Give diligence to make your calling and election sure. Give diligence. Put energy into it. Be enthusiastic about doing this. Making your calling and election sure. Make sure you're one of the elect. And how will you know that you're one of the elect? By making sure you're called. Effectually called. Called out of darkness into his marvelous light. Called from following Satan to following Christ. Have you been called? Changed? Transformed? Raised from the dead, as it were, being dead in trespasses and sins. And are you following the Lord? Make your calling and election sure. Or think of how it is in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 13. Examine yourself whether you be in the faith. Prove your own self. So don't just take it for granted. So many today... They take it for granted. They've maybe gone forward at a crusade. They've maybe made a decision. They've said the sinner's prayer. And they've been told, never doubt it. You're a Christian. That's it now. Go on like that. Well, it's not like that. The Bible tells us we are to be constantly giving diligence to make our calling and election sure, examining ourselves whether we be in the faith, we who claim to be standing, well, let us make sure that we are standing, standing on Christ. Are we following him? Are there marks of grace in our lives? Remember, so many left the land of Egypt and perished in the desert. Let us make sure that we are amongst those who reach the promised land. <laughs> Do we know God? Do we have that personal relationship with him? So that it will be impossible for God to say, depart from me, I never knew you. God knows his own. Do we know him and he know us? Then that's what Christianity is. It's not a matter of mere beliefs. It's not a matter of mere practices or ritual. It's not a matter even of keeping commandments. It's a matter of a living relationship with a living God. Walking with him each day, Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him, took him to heaven. So, first then, the danger of self-deception. And then the second point that we have here is take heed lest you fall. Let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest you fall. You're standing. You're standing as a Christian. You're standing on Christ the rock. Now, be careful. Be careful tonight, tomorrow, this coming week, the following week, this coming year, and Whatever years God gives you in this life, take heed lest you fall. Remember, we're in a war. We've been seeing horrific images from Ukraine of warfare, and we're seeing the brutality of it, death on every side, all kinds of dangers. But in a sense, we're in a far more brutal war. We've got a horrible enemy who's not just trying to destroy our body, but trying to destroy our soul and to take us down to hell to be with himself forever. So, friends, we've got to be watching and praying, aware of the danger and aware of the enemy. So who is the enemy? Well, the Bible describes our enemy as the world, the flesh, and the devil. The world is mankind in its opposition to God. And mankind is in rebellion against God. And the world 
is trying to seduce us to follow worldly ways, and the world is trying to pressurize us to be like itself. Doesn't like those who are different, who are awkward. Those who are following Christ are regarded as disturbers of the peace. Remember when um, Paul was going round as a missionary and uh, he came to Thessalonica and it was said, those that have turned the world upside down have come here also. Well, that's the Christian. Christian somebody who turns the world upside down. And the world hates the Christian for that. So we've got to be aware that the world around us doesn't like us. Doesn't naturally like us. And if the world likes us too much, it's because we're not sufficiently like Christ, whom the world crucified. Beware when all men speak well of you. So did they of the false prophets long ago. Marvel not that the world hate you. Marvel if the world doesn't hate you. The world, before it hated you, it hated me, said Christ. So there's the world. And then there's the flesh. The flesh is particularly difficult for us to deal with because it's inside ourselves the roots of sin and corruption that's there. And it's a constant battle against the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life and covetousness and bad temper and idolatry, all these things that are so easy, so natural for us. The roots of sin are there and these weeds are coming up in our garden constantly and we've got to be cutting them back, rooting them out. The flesh. And then there's the great enemy, the devil. Going about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And the devil is stirring up the world to seduce us, to oppose us. And the devil is casting fire, as it were, upon the sparks of corruption that are in our hearts, throwing petrol, as it were, upon these sinful things that are inside us, these roots of sin, these sparks that are there to cause a blaze. Satan, sometimes as an angel of light, using the scriptures to tempt us and seduce us, other times coming to frighten us and disturb us, but often to lead us astray. So we need the whole armor of God. Let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest you fall. Put on that belt of truth. Be sure of God's word that it is the truth. Take the Shoes, preparation of the gospel of peace, prepared by the glad tidings of the gospel, rejoicing in that. The breastplate of righteousness, the righteousness of Christ, your sins are forgiven. The helmet of hope. The head is so vulnerable. But keep before your mind's eye where you're going, what's in front of you, what God has promised. Having this hope in yourself Purify yourself even as he is pure. Let hope be a helmet for your head. And then the shield of faith, able to quench all the fiery darts of the devil. Fiery darts, Molotov cocktails that the devil throws in as where to set us on fire. The shield of faith, trusting in Christ committing ourselves to him, depending upon him, and the sword of the Spirit. Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, him only shalt thou serve. It is written, man shall not live by bread alone. It is written. Yes, we are to take God's word and to apply it to whatever temptation Satan comes with. So, take heed lest you fall. Look after your soul. Make use of the means of grace. It's good 
to be here tonight under the preaching of the word. It's good to be regularly in church. Make sure that you're constantly reading the scriptures, meditating upon it, praying for help. Strengthen your soul with food from heaven and then you will be able to resist the temptations of Satan. Keep eternity in view. Remember there's a judgment day ahead. Fear not him who destroys the body, but fear him who will cast body and soul into hell. Meditate on the cross. Think of your Savior. Think of the agony he endured so that you would have heaven. When you're tempted to sin, remember the crown of thorns, the nail-pierced hands, the cry of dereliction from the cross. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why? For my sins. Oh, that we would hate sin as that which crucified Christ. But then moving on to the next verse. There is no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. You're not the only one to be tempted. The devil wants you to feel isolated. Feel that God's taken you, as it were, as a target for his arrows. He wants you to think that your life's far harder than that of others. So that you'll grumble and complain and be discontented with God. Now this word temptation, the Greek word, it's, it has two translations. Two English words and the two English words are temptation and trial. Sometimes it means trial, testing, and sometimes it means seduction to sin. The same word. So, and we can take it in both senses as it's here before us. There is no temptation taken you but such as is common to man, but God is faithful. There's no trial, there's no trial that has come your way but that which others are suffering too. You're suffering perhaps from illness. Maybe a loved one is seriously ill. Perhaps a bereavement has come your way. These things are hard to bear. Maybe there's trouble in the family, trouble in your marriage, trouble at work. Difficulties, problems, pains, weaknesses, fears. But there's no trial, no temptation taking you, but such as is common to man. Earlier we read from Job chapter 1. Just think of all that Job suffered. One day, one day, all his sheep, his camels, his oxen, his asses, all his wealth stolen from him, and his servants killed, and worst of all, his seven sons and three daughters died when a tornado hit their home. Just imagine if you lost all your wealth and you lost every one of your children one day. That's not easy. It's hard losing one child. But think of losing all your family. And what did Job say? The Lord gave and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Whatever trials we go through, remember... Others go through worse trials. You're not alone. And remember that trial comes from God. And God has measured these trials specifically for you. There is no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, 
who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able. So that's the first thing. And then think of temptation here as seduction to evil. Now, God would never tempt you to evil. James tells us that God is not tempted to evil, neither tempts he any man. God tempted Abraham, but it was in the sense of testing him, trying him, in that sense. But God allows the devil to tempt. And the devil certainly does tempt us to evil. He stirs up the flesh within us. He knows our weaknesses. And you and I should be aware of our weaknesses too. Situations in which we fall. Things which leave us particularly vulnerable. Things that we should avoid. We see here in verse 14. Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. Don't go around tinkering with it. Don't be joining with idolaters because if you do, the likelihood is that before long you're going to be worshipping idols too. Sometimes the best thing to do is to run away, to get away from certain situations, to keep out of certain company, to be aware of your dangers. Take, for example, the internet, pornography, what a massive problem it is today, even for some Christians. And it all starts with that first click. And you go down a certain road, and then it's addictive and it's destructive and it leaves you all ashamed and it destroys you and the devil's there laughing at you. He's, he's made a fool of you. Flee from idolatry. Flee from pornography. Things that you'll see on Netflix, again, so much of it can be seduction to sin, tempted to immoral thoughts and improper thoughts. So flee from idolatry and flee from that which would lead you to sin. And it's not a matter of saying, well, I can't help it, I'm just done, I'm just made that way. That's no excuse. We're born sinners, but by grace we're saved. We're born sinners, but reckon yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. You've been converted. You've got the Holy Spirit in your heart. Live as a born-again Christian. Be different. Don't just allow yourself to be led, as it were, by Satan with a ring in your nose into sin and filth, but stand apart from it. Use that shield of faith, able to quench all the fiery darts of the devil. Don't sell your soul for the trivial pleasures that Satan offers. Next, notice that God is faithful. When you feel overwhelmed by trials and testing, look up. When you feel desperate, remember your Father is in heaven. Remember that he is the sovereign Lord. Remember that he says to you, all things work together for good. All things, not just some things, but all things work together for good. And remember that God measures exactly what you're going through so that there's not too much. It's just right for you. Somebody who's involved in competitive sport, they have trainers, and these uh, people train them. They, they say you're to do this, you're to do that, the certain exercises, and they push you to the limits. Sometimes they push you too far, and there's an injury, and there's a breaking, but God will never push you too far. God's the perfect trainer, and he sets for you exactly what is appropriate, what is good for you. He knows all things work together for good. 
And we think of Job. Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. That's wonderful, isn't it? Though God kill me, I'll still keep trusting in him. That's faith. And the victory that overcometh the world is our faith. Yeah. Take no thought for the morrow. Instead of worrying about tomorrow and tomorrow's developments of problems, just face the problems today. Take it a day at a time. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Keep clinging to the Lord. Keep looking up. People worry about a nuclear war and Putin's ability to press that button and send nuclear weapons around the world. But what comfort it is to know that Putin can't press any button but only the button that the Lord allows him to press. Putin can do nothing without God. No matter how strong he feels he is, he's no stronger than a feather in God's presence. God does what he wishes, and God does what is best, and God is working out his purposes, and this world will come to an end not with a nuclear war, but with the return of Christ. And while the world remains, God will have his people. God is faithful then. So when trials are overwhelming you, look up. Remember, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. God will help you through. And then when we think of temptation, temptation to sin, resist the temptation again, remembering God's faithfulness. How God has looked after you in the past. How God has helped you. How God has saved you. Don't be an idolater. Don't worship false gods. Don't join with those uh, who are feasting for idols. Don't be like the Israelites. Grumbling in the wilderness. We've got no bread to eat. And then God gives them manna. All we've got to eat is this light bread. We're fed up of it. And yet there was, there, were ne- there was never invented better bread than manna. It was the best food possible. It had all the essential ingredients. It was so good that Moses, eating it for the last 40 years of his life, at the age of 120, his strength was as strong as it ever was. His eye had never lost any of its ability to see. This wonderful food that God gave. And yet they complain. So don't be a grumbler. Don't be a complainer. Don't be lusting like the Israelites. Seduced by the the Moabites. So that they followed these Moabite women. And followed the direction of Balaam. who Who said to the Moabites the way to destroy Israel is to seduce them into fornication and into idolatry. Very clever man, but the devil's clever. But you and I must hate the devil and all his his works and resist him and oppose him and stand against him. And remember, remember, God loves you. And the Lord Jesus Christ loved you so much as that he died for you on the cross. And let the love of Christ constrain you to new obedience. How can I do this against the one who loved me so much? How could I go on in this way and hurt my beloved Savior? God is faithful. Remember the faithfulness of God. And then finally, there is a way of escape. But will with the temptation also make a way of escape that ye may be able to bear it. God's trials and testings that come to us, they're always measured. He knows our weaknesses. He knows our strengths. 
He will push us, but he won't push us too far. And these trials that come our way, they are making us stronger. Think of, of Abraham. Abraham was terribly tried by God. God said to him, take the child of your old age, your son, your only son Isaac, and go three days journey and offer him up as a sacrifice to me. His beloved son, he had to take him three days journey. And all these three days thinking about what he was going to do and then climbing up the hill, leaving the servants behind and Isaac saying to him, well, we've got wood here and we've got fire, but where's the lamb? He didn't say, you're the lamb. He said, God will provide. And then setting up the altar, placing the wood upon it, and then placing his son upon the altar. And only, only at the very last moment, when he had lifted up his hand with a knife to slay his son, believing that God was able to raise him from the dead, God stopped him. A trial, a hard trial, but there was a way of escape. And there's always a way of escape. And if we trust God and the faithfulness of God, he'll help us through. He'll get us through it. So, there's always a way of escape. And there's always a door through. And God will always help us. The trials, Psalm 30, 34, the trials that afflict the just, a number many be, but yet at length, out of them all, the Lord will set him free. There's always a door out and there's help in time of need. And it's the same with being tempted to sin. There's always a right path. People sometimes say, oh well, it's a matter of the, the lesser of two evils. But it's never that. There's always a right path and a wrong path. Teach me, O oh Lord, the perfect way of thy precepts divine. Show me thy ways, O oh Lord. Thy paths, O oh, teach thou me. As we read God's word, as we meditate upon it, as we pray, God shows us the way. Flee from idolatry. Turn your back on sin. Don't let the devil triumph over you. God is the one who always causeth us to triumph in every place. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us and gave himself for us. So friends, there's challenge here. Let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Do you think you stand? Right, well, you think you stand, take heed, be careful that you don't fall. There hath no temptation taken you but such as is common to man. There's no trial has come your way but such as other people suffer too. But God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tried above that you are able, but will with the trial make a way of escape so that you are able to bear it. And when it comes to tempted to sin, remember the situation's not impossible. By the Holy Spirit, by the grace of God, you can overcome temptation. You can stand firm. Be steadfast, unmovable. Stand fast in Christ. Trusting in the Lord. There's no temptation taking you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful. Look to a faithful God. And with the help of God, you can overcome temptation. Stand fast for Christ and flee from idolatry. Run from sin and remember, God loves you and God cares for you and is watching over your life and always providing a way of escape for you. Let's pray.